My guest on this week's episode of Suds and Search is Eli Schwartz. Eli is a growth advisor to some of the biggest brands in the world and the author of the fantastic new book, Product-Led SEO. Eli led the SEO team at SurveyMonkey, building organic search from nearly zero to one of the largest growth drivers at the company. Eli has also provided SEO consulting to large brands such as WordPress, Shutterstock, Blue Nile, Quora, Zendesk, and many others. He is an in-demand speaker presenting all over the world at conferences like PubCon, SMX, and Content Marketing World. He's also acted as a judge at numerous industry award shows, including the U.S. Search Awards, U.K. Search Awards, and the U.S. Interactive Marketing Awards. Writing a book about SEO is famously difficult. The industry changes so fast that by the time the book comes out, we're liable to have several new three-letter acronyms to learn. Product-Led SEO is perhaps the best book I've ever read on SEO. Eli does an amazing job giving the reader real-world advice born out of more than a decade of working on some of the most complex SEO problems imaginable. It's a glimpse into how one of the brightest minds in SEO actually performs the work. I'm going to start our conversation by talking all about product-led SEO. We'll discuss how product-led SEO is different from traditional approaches to SEO and how he thinks about compound growth in relation to SEO. Eli is also an expert in international SEO. We'll spend some time chatting with him about the intricacies of running an international SEO campaign for a massive brand. Grab something cold to drink and join me for a conversation with Eli Schwartz. We'll talk about why SEO is a job for humans, how to do keyword research for international brands, and we'll spend a little time talking about his experience living overseas. Eli Schwartz, welcome to Southern Search. How are you doing? It's great to be here, Mark. It's great to have you on. This is like a, a scoop for the first time in Southern Search history. We've got uh, the author of Product-Led SEO on here. This book came out and then it was just all over SEO Twitter. I saw everybody promoting it. The, the forward has a bunch of recommendations from like a who's who in the SEO industry, Eric Enga, Aleda, and everybody in between. Um, so I, I wanted to start with just kind of an open-ended question. It's famously hard to write an SEO book. The industry changes so quickly. Um, there's no way you could have written about like mum that just came out. And uh, so, so what, what made you want to write a book about SEO in the first place? What, what, what drew your interest? So the, there are a bunch of motivations for writing the book. You know, my team at SurveyMonkey motivated me to write the book because I was always telling them the same things over and over. And they're like, you should write this down. But one of the biggest things that of the reasons I want to write a book is like, I'm a consultant and I talk to a lot of different people about SEO. And they're like, where can I read more about this? And like, I never have anywhere to send them because you, as you read the book, the book is, it's not a book about tactics. It's not a book. Right. You know, I mentioned Burton. I mentioned some things related to search. But the book is not meant to be obsolete for many years because like the strategy and the way to think about search shouldn't change. And those are the things that I talk to companies about all the time and I talk to leaders about all the time. And there is nowhere for them, like a book for them to learn more. Obviously, like I don't think I said anything at all that's new in the book. You can read this on blogs. You can you know, hear it in podcasts. You can certainly find it all on Twitter. But no CEO is going to go look at SEO Twitter. No CEO right. is going to go listen to podcasts. So like I put it in a place where like those kind of folks can like read about it and understand it. And again, it's not novel, but like it, you know, rings more true to them when they've read it in a book. No, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And <laughs> congratulations on this. It's been uh, it's just really well received so far by the SEO community. The title of the book, Product Led SEO, I, you know, I, I mentioned before we got on air that I I read as much of it as I could to get ready for this interview, but I, I'm wondering if we could kind of set the table for the conversation. Product-led SEO, what, what does that mean and how is it different from more, you know, maybe traditional approaches to SEO? Yeah, the, the title I sort of stumbled upon, like it, it just seemed like a really good way to sum up exactly what I was talking about. So I, I think the better way of understanding product-led SEO is to, is to think about the way SEO is typically done. And that's what I talk a lot about in the beginning of the book, which is, the way SEO is typically done is you go in and find some keywords that your product or your business is about, and then you go to a search keyword tool and they're really all the same, whether you're paying for one or whether you're using Google, you get the top searched keywords for that industry or for your vertical, and then you go and write some content and then you do a bunch of tactics and you hope it's going to rank. But really there's no real thought about, or not enough thought about the user and like why you're going to create this content. and who's going to be searching for it and what they expect to see when they search for it. So I started thinking about SEO in a different way, which is 
should this continuum exist? Like, why would someone go and search for it? And if they search for it, what are, what are they expecting to do? And is the expectation of what they're going to do something that will work out for the business? And then the, the way of explaining that that I came up with is this product-led SEO, which is like, this is actually a product. Like, before mm. I'm going to go and create this content, think about it like from a product standpoint. Should mm. this exist? Is there a buyer, user right. at the other end of this? And if there is, let me tie in all the other pieces of our product, which is I need a designer, I need a content mm -hmm. person, I need an engineer. Now I'm going to pitch this as a product, something to invest in. This makes a lot more sense actually for larger companies, which think about everything from a product standpoint. But like that's the idea, which is, you know, maybe typical SEO is like, here's a keyword. My major input here is a writer who's going to write a bunch of content and then post it up on a, a blog post. I think about it differently, which is it's a providing something of value to a user, which is a product, it's a widget, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a thing. And you want to put more of those inputs into it, which is, does it need to be a thousand words or just, should it be 200 words? Is it going to be image rich or is it going to be text rich? Is it going to be, you know, and again, from a product standpoint, I like to think about the user and where the user is, which is, is the user on a mobile device? Are they on a laptop? Are they on a desktop? What are all those things? And not the default, which is search is mobile first, so you have to do mobile. And like, you know, when I'm talking to SaaS companies, a lot of times their customers are certainly not on mobile. Like who's buying cloud services <laughs> right. from their phone, right? So like, that's why, that's the way I think about, about it as a product and it's product-led SEO. Yeah, I like this. I, I love that that idea of the desktop and mobile. I've heard you speak about this before. It's about like zigging when everyone else is zagging. Um, I like that very much. It, yeah, I, I want to stick with a couple more questions on the book real quick, though. The There's a chapter titled SEO is a job for humans that I thought was really interesting in light of everything we're hearing about AI. This is like, it, it seems like there's almost this unspoken expectation that a lot of SEO tasks can be automated by tools, that the tools are getting increasingly sophisticated. So some of those tasks can be done. But the chapter discusses, among other things, the limitations of tools. Um, you mentioned that there are several tools that you use every day. You got no problem with tools, but yeah, I wonder if you could help me out here. And you know, what are the limitations of SEO tools, and what part of this has to be done by humans? I think it's really important to break down what is SEO and what is product creation. So that's where I think the limitation of tools are. So yes, could you optimize title tags with a tool? Certainly. Could you come up with the keywords you should use with a tool? Certainly. Should you be creating entire pieces of content based on tools? Of course not. Mm -hmm. Like one thing I've been looking at, like, you know, just before we got on this recording is I'm hopefully going to be traveling this summer and I need to buy a new microphone, right? I want to mm -hmm. buy a better microphone that, you know, will capture sound, but it's nice and small. Okay. If I read an AI written piece of content, how is that going to actually help me to physically buy a microphone Good point. that I'm going to like, right? So like, is that SEO? Well, certainly you can have AI write the content, but does AI like, does AI pack that microphone into a suitcase? Does it put it into a pocket? Does it like listen to the sound and say, well, do I feel like I'm in the same room as that person or not? Like, yes, you could throw obviously the name of products at it and could do a versus comparison, but that's like it's not written for a human, it's written for another machine. So like, if Google's the machine you're writing for and you wanna rank on Google, great. But if you wanna to sell to a human, you want a human to click on that and then click buy. And like, again, there's a lot of aspects to SEO which are not the typical aspects that you know SEO might think of. I may go into Best Buy, into an actual physical store and follow up on the microphone I read about. That's not like, how can you, how can AI optimize that search experience, mm -hmm. ranking on Google and encouraging me to go to Best Buy, right? So like, that's where I think SEO really ends. SEO ends at that final experience. You know, in, in my book, I talk about Zillow, one of my favorite examples of product-led SEO, because they created a product around people's addresses. Like, how do you AI convincing someone to spend money right. on a house and do all those things, right. like get a mortgage and this is my house where I want to raise my kids, like, that's not SEO. Yes, you could write title tags. If that's what you call SEO, that's great. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in the car industry, you know, in within cars, like there's so much emotion that goes into it. So like you can rank on like best car for families, but like what kind of family, what kind of dog needs to go in that car? So SEO is an entire picture, an entire user journey, not just a title tag, a fast page, a keyword.
you know, the tools can do that, but they can't do that entire journey. Oh, amen. I, I love it. And I, I think that the entire book, I, I'm going quickly because I want to cover so many topics, but I think that's such a great point that you made that about the human part of this. So the, the next thing I wanted to cover was something I've heard you actually present on before, and then I read about it in the book. So there's a theme I've noticed, I guess, throughout your career. So you, you talk about compounding growth, so sort of like not, so, not such a focus on linear growth, but logarithmic growth, the, the classic finance lesson of compounding interest. You, you sort of take this into, S, into marketing generally, and then SEO specifically. You know, in your career, how have you seen this concept of compounding SEO play, play out? How, how has that worked? Yeah, so when I started my career, I, uh, I thought about SEO from a very transactional standpoint. How like will someone click on this keyword and is it worth the money I invest in it? Actually, when early, early in my SEO career, I actually had a budget to buy links. So like there was a direct investment into I want to rank on a keyword, buy a link for that sort of think about it as PPC. The way I think about SEO is it's compounding growth. I was recently on a, a call with a CEO talking about potential growth from SEO for their channel. And they're in a hyper, hyper growth category where they are going to make hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in general on their business. And they want to drive more acquisition from SEO. So this is a business that's going to drive, you know, again, hundreds of millions of dollars total. They think SEO can contribute 20% of that growth over the next five years. So let's say that's a billion to $2 billion for the entire business over the next five years, 20%, let's say it's just a billion. So that's $200 million they expect to drive from SEO. Just again, it's not, it's not ranking on keywords. It's the nature of their business. People are going to find their business from search. So $200 million are going to come from that search channel. That's compounding growth. Yeah. That growth, that $200 million will never start if they don't start with like, let's earn $10 from like one longest tail keyword possible that someone clicked through and became a, a user. So it starts with the $10 and they believe it will get to $200 million. And I think it will go further than $200 million because like that category could get bigger or the search demand could get bigger. So that's the way I like to think about SEO is like, and when you think about that investment, asking that company to spend $100,000, $200,000 on an SEO investment over the next few years, that's a drop in the bucket. In the Companies market. do that all the time on paid marketing. They spend just to break even. And here, they're not going to spend $200 million on SEO. I don't even know what you could spend on $200 million to grow SEO. Right, so, I'd like, like to find out, but yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. When you think about it like that way, that's compounded growth. Right, right. Well, awesome. I, I, I love this concept. I, I think the last part about product-led SEO I wanted to talk to you about was how to build out the team. So you mentioned this is an action plan. The book isn't just a bunch of tactics. And I really liked this part because it's uh, – it's sort of you playing uh, chess where other people are playing checkers. You kind of understand how the executive is involved and the multiple disciplines involved. And there's sort of a maestro in the, in the middle organizing the whole thing. Yeah, you know, from, from your perspective, how do you construct a product led SEO team correctly? So it really comes down to the culture of a company. So essentially at a very, very high level, SEO is a product team. And I, I, you know, I was very, very fortunate in that I accidentally ended up reporting to chief product officer for almost a year. And I, that's what enabled me to start yeah. thinking about SEO as a Makes product, yeah. where it's like I had engineers at my disposal. So when, you know, most of SEO is in marketing. So the resources you have are marketers. You have like a content writer, maybe you have a designer because they're on your marketing team. Maybe you're affiliated with the PR team so that it helps with links. When I was on a product team, in order for me to get anything to happen, I had to put it on a product roadmap. I had to explain why it was a priority. And then I had engineers that were willing to do it if my priority made sense. And then I was able to call upon marketing to support me rather than be on the marketing team. Mm. And again, the same thing. I had to explain priorities. I had to you know, be able to get those design resources. I had to be able to get the content. Best thing about being on a product team is when the content team, the marketing team did not satisfy requests, product teams have to ship products. So they, they have budget. So they go outside the marketing team like, you don't want to support us. Hey, I got budget. I'll buy my own content. Like, yeah. you know, when you're on an, a marketing team as an SEO and you're like, well, you don't want to fix my website. I'm going to go get other engineers to build a new website. Never going to happen. Right. right? But like, much better be on a product team. And you're like, you don't want to support me. Good. I got budget. I'm getting freelancers. So Sweet. Yeah. 
Yeah, the way you set up a product team and the way you do product-led SEO is really within the culture of a company. You know, I, I've worked with companies where everything is done with a quick Slack message and I've worked with companies where everything is done with like 10-page docs explaining how you want to do what you have to do. So that's where I think SEO needs to be a product. Do everything exactly like the product team does instead of the way SEO typically does, which is like, can you fix this title tag? Can you fix, uh, you know, this H1? Can you add alt text on this image? Really think about it as a product, like here's how we're going to redesign the homepage. Here's how long it's going to take. Here are the resources necessary. Here's what my expected returns are going to be. Or is this just hygiene and I want to do it? I don't think there'll be expected returns. So let's do it in the week of Christmas when, you know, we're sort of open but not open. All and right. there's just an engineer that's bored because they don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Well, I wanted to shift gears if we could to... Uh, international SEO. So you have a reputation in this area. You, in the book, even, you can see some of these incredible brands you've worked with. You mentioned SurveyMonkey and Quora and WordPress, obviously different capacities in, at each of these organizations. But this is your reputation is very strong in international SEO. And um, you kind of understand there's like really unique problems. So I'm an SEO. I don't understand a lot of the problems that you come up with a lot. And so I thought I would, I would start with something that's almost so basic I couldn't, I, I didn't know how to ask it better, but we all know that keyword research is so important. We know that that's kind of a foundational thing. When you have websites in many, many different languages with different jargon, uh, maybe they call it a vendor in one country and a supplier in another, for instance, you know, how do you even begin to do the first steps like keyword research? Is this, is this uh, as daunting as it sounds? No, I, I mean, personally, I like it. I like languages. So like I, I spent time going to other websites and uh, trying to understand the way they do things. Now, the funny thing is I, I'm hoping to travel internationally this summer and I was looking at some international airlines websites. So like Lufthansa, that website feels so awkward to me. And I wonder if Germans go on United and they're like, what is going on? Like, why do they just like encourage me to buy? And why are all these prices all over the place? Like Lufthansa, like you want to understand how much baggage fees are. There's like this big call to action that says to the calculator. So I don't know what that, how they write that in German, but in English it goes to the calculator. So, you know, that's the, I, I love those international nuances that you look at, you know, any international website and you want to know, like, do they use this word vendor? Do they use the word supplier? You do a side by side like Google Translate and then you, figure, you look at the similarities. Now, honestly, I think international SEO has gotten a lot easier over the okay. last few years because Google doesn't do that much international SEO. They're doing like the way Google will approach the way Google used to do search is used to need to get words directly correct. Right. Like if it was vendor, you needed vendor If it was supplier, you need supplier. But now I think like AI has gotten really good that it's like good enough. And if you search one and everyone else uses the other, you'll you'll kind of show up. Like I don't think Google has like a an algorithm for German rankings. I don't think they have an algorithm for French rankings. I do think when it comes to like Asian languages like Thai or Japanese or Korean, I've seen like it gets a lot weirder, whereas the spelling becomes different. So it, I mean I'm not I'm not as effective in those languages where I can't read the languages where we can't read the characters. But you are able to see those similarities. So I, I, I personally, I find it fun to like find those words. I love it. And I, I don't think you can go as wrong as you used to have to end up going. Like when you just got the words wrong and, you know, your, your sentences were structured wrong. You just weren't going to rank. And like if you want to do better SEO, you just figured out how to structure the sentence better. And suddenly you were ranking. Well, I, I think one of the things I liked about your book and I liked about I've liked about you for a while now is that you're not you, you, you're really good in international SEO, but you're not. Some people like to be in their silo. I'm a technical SEO auditor. That's it. And uh, you've got a, a breadth of knowledge that's pretty wide. And so in the book, you talk about link building. I've heard you talk about this before. Along the same lines, I feel like we do link building and we're looking in a very, very small area. We're local SEO, so it's usually like a city, community involvement, those sorts of things. Again, it's the same sort of thing. When I think about trying to build links in Thailand and trying to build links in Greenland, you know, this sounds like a very, very difficult challenge. You know, how do you, you have all these, these skills. How do you uh, even begin to organize a link building campaign on an international website? So 
in my book, I talk a lot about st the strategy around SEO and the, the thinking around SEO. So I would, if I were working, and I am working with a company right now that's thinking about Japan. So rather than say, here are the tactics you need to do in Japan, here's the specific websites you need to get links from in Japan, we're approaching it from a strategic standpoint, which is here's what you do in the US, you have a PR team, you issue these releases, you do these partnerships, do the exact same thing in Japan, and likely the pins will fall the same way. Wow. And yeah. I, I, you know, my, my experience with link building is, you know, I, like I said, I, you know, early in my career, I had a link building budget. Right. And now I, I don't know that a lot of links are as effective on a global scale as they used to be. Okay. So for example, like when I'm talking to companies like major companies, they ask me about links and usually they've read a lot about links. I think like a, let's say a car dealer in, uh, in Houston, maybe their links are effective because like if they get some like guest post links, I think their links are great because their competitive set is a lot smaller. They're competing right. against other car dealers in Houston. So if they get the backlink from a good, I don't know, let's chamber of commerce with that anchor text car dealer in Houston, that can be effective for them. Whereas like with a global company, getting a single link doesn't necessarily move the doesn't needle, move right? The needle, like right. let's say Zillow yeah. wants to rank on real estate, getting a single link from the Federal Reserve is probably not going to tip the scale. If they come up with a way that every single bank in the United States wants to link to Zillow, that's a whole different no, matter. So they, their effort is right, better suited there. So that, that's the way I'll think about it. So like, I don't think about a link building campaign in Greenland. I think about a launch plan in Greenland. Like how do you get a bunch of people to think about your product, to think about your brand, to know you exist in Greenland and the links will come there. Like if you're getting a bunch of people tweeting about you, probably you'll get us some links about it too. But if like no one will organically talk about you, no one will organically link you. Ah, it's beautiful. I, I, I just love the way you think. Um, the last thing I would say, this is everyone's favorite part of the show. This is where Greg Gifford gives me a question for the guest and he gives me no context. So I don't know what he's talking about. And presumably, you know, so let's see. For, <laughs> for Eli Schwartz, he, he said, he was like, like a little bit bummed about this one. He said, just ask him living overseas. Does there some, does that ring a bell to you living overseas at all? Yeah. So uh, I was very fortunate and I spent almost two years living in Singapore. Wow. Uh, Greg may have been one of the first people I told. I was at, uh, I think it was MozCon and Greg was, it was like, Hey, are you going to go to this conference in, uh, the summer or something like that? Or am I going to see you at PubCon? And I was like, no, I'm actually trying to move to Singapore. I don't have a job yet. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to be there. So I'm not going to see you for a little bit of time or maybe I'll never see you again if I, if I love it so much. So I ended up going overseas to Singapore with SurveyMonkey but I had initially gotten a job offer from another company at an agency to, they were gonna move me out there, move my whole family out there, and I was gonna lead this team. And then SurveyMonkey, the, you know, the founder of, or sorry, the CEO of SurveyMonkey, Dave Goldberg, who I dedicated my book to, he didn't accept that I was gonna be leaving SurveyMonkey. He wanted me to stay with the company and he allowed me to essentially create my own job and you know, it facilitated my move over there, which is why I dedicated my book to him, because like, that was the biggest leap I've ever taken in my career. Like the ability to be an entrepreneur on my own, like while working for a company, while having benefits, being able to be in a foreign country while having health insurance and the support and managers and all that. So that was an, that was an incredible experience. The reason I was motivated to do it and going back to your question about international SEO is like, I wanted to make a career in international SEO. And I thought that international SEO and international was a little bit different than other SEO. And I, now I don't think it's that different. And I thought like, I don't have any credibility in international without actually having any international experience. Mm. I can't like tell people, here's how you're gonna do SEO for Asia. When like all I've done about Asia is like read a book or watch some YouTube Got videos. It. I wanted to like personally experience it. So that was part of the motivation for it. And you know, I also really wanted to have a good time, which I had an amazing time. I was able <laughs> to see, uh, you know, all the, the, the fun places around Asia, around Southeast Asia. And I, you know, an SEO angle I had there is like, I understood more about international SEO and more about how Google does international. It's like, there isn't that much content for international markets. So, uh, you know, in Singapore, when I'd search for certain things, I would actually see American websites that couldn't even ship to Singapore. And that was Google just being like, well, mm -hmm. I don't want to just put a result here with five results. So we're just going to give you the entire thing, but you can get a bunch of American sites that are completely useless to you. Oh my gosh. Well, that was a, 
That was one of my favorite no context Greg questions of all time. That was it was a great answer. So I love it. Um, and now you live you're back in the states now. You're in Silicon Valley or something like that, or somewhere. No, I moved to Houston. You're in Houston. Uh, ever- Everyone was leaving California, and I really didn't want to be the last one there. <laughs> so you didn't want to turn out the lights. I like it. <laughs> I didn't want to turn out the lights. Oh, and wow. everyone was moving to Austin, and I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't follow the trend. I had to do something slightly different. So I'm in Houston. Well, we're gonna be in, we're gonna be in Texas all the time. It's not. Too, we'll be in Dallas usually, so our office is there. But uh, I'd love to get a steak or see a see a show in in Houston. Whatever, whatever comes up. So. Uh, before I let you go, Eli, how do people get in touch with you? What's your favorite social media and where can they go to find the book? My favorite social media is LinkedIn, but I've recently started doing a lot more Twitter to find it. Twitter's more engaging. So LinkedIn, just look up Eli Schwartz, Twitter handle is five L E. You could pick up the book on Amazon or, uh, I've since discovered that people hate Amazon and won't give Amazon any money. So I think there, you can buy the book everywhere else. Books are sold, even Barnes and Noble. Uh, I don't know if you could find it in a store. I don't even know if stores are open. And then I, I do have an awesome website, productledseo.com, which Wix was kind enough to actually design and, and build for me. So you get check out that site or and that will direct you to buy the book or you can go on Amazon to find the book. And really, really great to have this conversation with you, Mark. It's, it's been a long time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Eli, I'm going to sign off for now with a virtual cheers. Thank you again for coming on. And uh, we'll see you guys next week for another episode of Suds and Search. Great here. Thanks, Mark. 